In today's video, we're going to explore the new ASP.NET Core Endpoint routing support in Server Stack 8.1. We'll guide you through the process of upgrading your existing Server Stack solutions to leverage this huge improvement, which brings enhanced capability with third-party libraries such as Swashbuckle for OpenAPI v3 specification generation. This upgraded integration support for ASP.NET routing brings with it enhanced capabilities for your server stack APIs with the broader ASP.NET Core ecosystem. Previously, while the server stack HTTP request pipeline already used the ASP.NET Core endpoint routing mechanism, it was mostly a black box by passing all the details of the request forwarded into server stack's own request pipeline. With the introduction of mapped endpoints in Server Stack 8.1, you can now integrate your Server Stack APIs with standard ASP.NET Core endpoints in a much more cohesive way. This opens up the ability to employ common third-party tooling like the Swashbuckle package for generating open API v3 specifications for your Server Stack APIs just like any other endpoint. In this video, we'll focus on how you can take advantage of these new opt-in routing capabilities by walking through the upgrade process for your existing Server Stack solutions. To enable this functionality, we need to update the way that Server Stack is initialized in ASP.NET Core applications. Instead of initializing the app host by itself, we now need to move the discovery of the server stack APIs to earlier in the setup. In today's video, we will take an existing application that has just upgraded to server stack 8.1 and apply those steps we need to make to make our application compatible with ASP.NET Core endpoints. With those changes made, we will then add support for generation of the Open API v3 specifications based on your Server Stack APIs, which then can be added to your Server Stack solution using a mixed template or by adding a few lines of code with the serverstack.aspnet core open API package. If you're starting a new solution using one of our templates, support for ASP.NET Core endpoints is already set up for you. And the patterns you need to maintain this compatibility are already in place for you to follow. Here we have a Blazor Wasm application that targets .NET 8 and has been upgraded to use Server Stack 8.1, but it doesn't yet support the use of ASP.NET Core endpoints for your Server Stack API. The changes that need to be applied to add this support can be broken down into four types. They are app host initialization, moving to ASP.NET Core's built in dependency injection system, server stack plugin initialization, and service dependency resolution. Navigating to your application's program.cs file, we originally have this app.use server stack with a new app host instance passed in as an argument. And if you look at where in the order of your program.cs file this line is located, you can see it is actually quite late in the initialization of your ASP.NET Core application. And this is where it currently kicks off the process of discovering your server stack APIs and the related request DTOs. However, to use the ASP.NET Core endpoints, we will have to move this service discovery mechanism to a lot earlier in the application's lifecycle. Specifically, we will have to use a new services.addServiceStack call, which it passes in the related assembly for your service stack services. And just like other middleware, here is where you can configure additional aspects of your server stack integration, which we'll come back to later. Now, if we scroll down back to our app.use server stack call, we'll then configure some additional options, specifically the options.map endpoints call. And this is how we opt in to use ASP.NET Core endpoints for your server stack services. So now that we've told our application we are going to use ASP.NET Core endpoints, we need to migrate the use of the func IOC container that comes with server stack and 
use the ASP.NET Core's built-in dependency injection system. For example, if we navigate in this project to configure.db.cs, we can see that we're registering a singleton IDB connection factory with an ORM-like connection factory to our Funk IOC container. And this is being called in the configure app host method. We will need to instead move this to the builder.configure services so we can utilize ASP.NET Core's built-in dependency injection. So our code will change to configure services and then calling services.addSingleton with the same code. If you're using apphost.app settings to access details in your app settings.json, you can change this to use the context argument to the configure services method so you can then access the configuration of your app settings file. Another related change you'll have to make in the configure app host to the configure services method are the registrations of the service stack plugins. For example, here we have the registration of apphost.plugins.add passing in a new admin database feature plugin. Instead, we will have to move this to the configure services method and call the services.add add plugin extension method passing in the new admin database feature just like before. If you need to resolve interrelated dependencies between your different iHosting startup classes, you can use the get required service method of the iService provider. This can be done by passing in a Lambda function to your add singleton calls of the iService collection or services variable in the configure services method. And now that our plugins, services, and IOC dependencies have all been moved to earlier in the application setup, we now need to change the way those dependencies are injected into your services. ASP.NET Core's built-in dependency injection system doesn't support property-based injection. Instead, you must use constructor-based injection, which can be quite verbose as you need to declare the dependencies you're having injected in both the constructor and as properties as well. Thankfully, in c 12, we get the introduction of a new feature called primary constructors, which greatly reduces the verbosity of constructor injection. Primary constructors allow you to declare the type and the name of a property directly in line with your class name. So for example, if you have a service that already has property-based injection from previously using service stack's func IOC, you can move just the type and the name inside parentheses just like you were declaring a normal constructor inside a class, but this time the statement is in line with your class declaration. So to recap the four different types of changes we've made to this application, we have change the way our app host is initialized in the program.cs file. We have changed to use ASP.NET Core's built-in dependency injection system in our different hosting startup classes, as well as the way that plugins are initialized, moving them to the configure services method and the services.add plugin method. And lastly, we've updated our services to use constructor-based injection using c 12's primary constructor feature. For smaller service stack applications, this migration can be done relatively quickly, but for larger applications, you can also stick with the current service stack setup without using the ASP.NET Core endpoints. However, one of the big advantages of using endpoints for your service stack APIs is that it moves your application closer to ASP.NET Core defaults and therefore the larger ASP.NET Core open source ecosystem. And a good example of this is the use of Swashbuckle, which is an open source library that can generate your open API v3 specifications for your ASP.NET Core endpoints. So this means you can generate your open API v3 specifications for minimal APIs, your web APIs, and your service stack APIs, all using the same tooling. And to make this even easier, we've created a new service stack.ASP.NET Core.open API package as well as a mix template that you can add to your project where you're using ASP.NET Core endpoints. 
you can use the Service Tag X tool to run the command X mix open API 3 and this will automatically create a configure.openapi.cs file that handles all the configuration for you. If we now run our application and navigate to forward slash swagger, we will be greeted with the familiar swaggy UI with all our Service Tag APIs populated. If you need to customize the way your Service Stack APIs are described in the generated OpenAPI v3 specification, you can use the extensive options provided by the Swashbuckle library. By bringing Service Stack APIs closer to ASP.NET Core functionality and defaults, you can get even more reuse out of your existing Service Stack APIs as well as integrate it deeper with other tooling needed for your projects. Well that's it for this video, if you have any questions or feedback please let us know in the comments or get in touch with us on our community discord or github discussions. Service Stack is free for individuals and open source projects so anyone is welcome and as always thanks for watching.